Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's um, a great pleasure to have been invited back to the South China Sea Conference again this year. And um, I'm particularly pleased to have been invited to um, moderate the session this afternoon, which I think will be a very interesting and hopefully dynamic discussion. So the Australian Embassy in Hanoi is very pleased to be supporting the conference once again. And I am honored to be part of the discussion today with such a diverse group of academics and officials who bring such a tremendous um, range of experience. And I am particularly pleased to moderate this session, which is focused on the legal order at sea, including the landmark 2016 South China Sea Arbitral Award. This is not only a topical issue, but it's a critical topic, as international law and the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea remains the bedrock framework for all conduct in our oceans. In recent times, we've seen rules, norms, and laws in the maritime domain continue to be challenged. And therefore, it's essential that we continue dialogue to reinforce our shared understanding of international law. And this is crucial to maintaining peace and stability in the South China Sea. During the panel discussion today, speakers will discuss the legal order in the South China Sea, including by looking at various challenges in this field. And in covering this topic, speakers will look at the arbitral award and discuss how countries have used the ruling as a reference point to advance positions. Our speakers will also offer predictions about the future order at sea and how the legal framework may evolve. Today's discussion comes at a very important time. 2021 marks the fifth anniversary of the South China Sea arbitral award. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing from our panelists about how this ruling has shaped countries' understanding of UNCLOS and how it is influencing the international legal order. Today, we are very privileged to hear from an impressive lineup of panelists, many of whom will be known to members of the audience. In the interests of time, I won't go through their detailed biographies and I'll leave you with the details in the conference pamphlet, but I will just list who we're going to hear from in the coming hour. First of all, Professor Jay Batongapal from the University of the Philippines, followed by Dr. Ling Tinghui, Deputy General Secretary of the Taiwanese Society of International Law, Chinese Taipei. Professor Nishimoto Kentaro will speak next from Tohoku University. And then we'll hear from Dr. Yan Yan, Director of the Research Center of Oceans Law and Policy in the National Institute for South China Sea Studies. And finally, on our list of speakers, Mr. Andrew Murdoch, who is a legal director at the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office. And our discussant this afternoon is Dr. Joanna Mossop, Associate Dean for Research in the Law Faculty at the Victoria University of Wellington. Before I invite Professor Patangapal to commence, I'd like to remind all panelists that you'll be given 10 minutes for your presentation. And I will gently remind you if you go over that threshold. In the interest of time, I'll save questions until after we've heard from all of our panelists. Thank you. And so now it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Jay Batangapal from the University of the Philippines. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Ambassador. Good afternoon to everyone, and thank you for inviting me again to this conference. Um, I will just share my screen, and we will talk about uh, one particular aspect of the legal order, which I think is of interest to all of us, since it could be argued that this is one of the main reasons why we have uh, these uh, disputes in the South China Sea. So we'll talk about the South China Sea Arbitration Award and Offshore Petroleum Exploration and Development uh, since that time. Now, uh, this is just the, since I have only 10 minutes, I'll go very over three points, uh, petroleum exploration activities in the South China Sea, uh, the uh, arbitration award and relevant jurisprudence and uh, laws, uh, and uh, some guidance on assessing the legality or legitimacy of activities based on what we can glean from the law and jurisprudence. First of all, just to briefly uh, remind everyone with respect to developments in petroleum activities in the South China Sea, especially in the last three years, we have seen of course, that uh, historically there have been many uh, attempts uh, or many activities on the part of the littoral states to try to explore and exploit petroleum resources in their continental shelf areas, proceeding from their uh, near shore uh, and expanding further outward. And perhaps it is because it has reached a point where the petroleum activities have really gone much further out than, than ever that the disputes with respect to petroleum uh, um, exploration and development 
have uh, intensified somewhat. Now, uh, in 2019 particularly, we have seen uh, a number of activities, not just the regular uh, petroleum uh, development that has been proceeding in the past few decades, but some activities which have raised concern because they appear to be unilateral activities undertaken in the exclusive economic zone of other states, meaning states that are uh, uh, that are not um, of the same, um, um, oh, sorry, uh, EEZs, uh, not of the same state. And we see here in 2019, the incidents recorded about the uh, exploration, seismic exploration apparently of the, the Haiyang DC-8 and activities uh, also not just on the Vietnamese side, but on the opposite side in the Malaysian side, close to Mala the Malaysian coastline near uh, around the Lukonia Shoals. We've also seen the following year uh, additional activities again on the Malaysian side uh, in uh, near Tokonya Shoals, but then also expanding into the area that has been uh, in the area um, jointly claimed by Malaysia and Vietnam as being part of their um, uh, continental extended continental shelves no? uh, and other activities. Uh, another activity later on, uh, particularly on the Malaysian side of the uh, South China Sea, there in the Malaysian EEZ outside of that jointly claimed area. And then in 20, just this year, we've seen again a repeat of these activities, uh, again, uh, closer to the Malaysian uh, side, no? uh, particularly the Kasiwari gas field. And the new development perhaps is, it is now expanded onto the Indonesian side uh, in areas uh, that are uh, included within um, Indonesia's uh, exclusive economic zone area and implicitly the continental shelf beneath it as well. So these activities uh, give us a kind of a snapshot no, of what our concerns are uh, with respect to petroleum development in the South China Sea. Now, the international law on this, however, is not as uh, clear cut, as not as visible as the illustrations that I've uh, showed you uh, um, based on what has been produced by the CSIS, uh, Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative. Uh, of course, our starting point will always be UNCLOS, and of note is that uh, in addition to uh, recognizing the rights of coastal states to their continental shelf areas and the right to explore and exploit them, it, it is always notable that uh, we should highlight the paragraph that stresses that in areas where there are overlapping continental shelves, uh, the, the law basically encourages the states concerned in a spirit of understanding and cooperation to make every effort to enter into provisional arrangements of a practical nature and during this period to not jeopardize or hamper the reaching of a final agreement. This underscores uh, what has been called a dual, in, uh, dual incentive. First is to incentivize cooperation uh, through provisional arrangements, and second, to disincentivize unilateral action uh, by uh, actions, meaning actions that jeopardize or hamper the reaching of final uh, agreement. Now, jurisprudence has also uh, support, supported this, no? Uh, in the fisheries jurisdiction case in 1974, uh, the uh, tribunal emphasized that states have mutual obligations to undertake negotiations in good faith for an equitable solution. So again, trying to promote uh, negotiations and cooperation, uh, hoping that they will uh, see the wisdom of arriving at an equitable solution. And in the GNC case, uh, one major issue was raised was the uh, unilateral drilling activities and in that case uh, the tribunal um, stated that seismic exploration activities per se, no, the use of seismic surveys, do not involve the establishment of drilling installations or the actual appropriation of natural resources or create the risk of physical damage to the seabed or subsoil and therefore they may be permissible. However, note that this indicates that if there are drilling operations or there is appropriation of natural resources or there is risk of physical damage then it um, impliedly would not be permissible now in the guyana suriname case in 2007 this was uh, in a way reinforced because again the tribunal stressed that the parties should try to negotiate in good faith and that means they should be prepared to make concessions in pursuit of a provisional arrangement. And this underscored the idea of meaningful negotiations, not negotiations just for form, just for the sake of doing them, but actually intended to produce an equitable result. 
It also stressed that it's not permissible for any party to undertake any unit, unilateral drilling activity as this would cause prejudice to the other party's rights. Uh, and again, um, although in just in passing, it seems that seismic surveys were considered as legally permissible. Now, um, there are uh, the the case also stressed again uh, the the importance of good faith negotiations. And interestingly, it also stated uh, that uh, states really should not resolve, resort to self help or to threats, no, especially against the operations of the other country, even if they do have uh, disputes. Now, in the provisional measures, uh, the request for provisional measures in the Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana case, uh, interestingly, uh, it was um, the tribunal was asked provisional measures uh, about uh, these continuing uh, exploration, uh, continuing drilling, and it was stated by the tribunal that the drilling basically causes permanent physical modification, which cannot be restored, which cannot be uh, attended to with compensation re and reparation, and. Um, it also indicated that even the acquisition and subsequent use of geological information could create a risk of irreversible prejudice to the rights of one of the parties, uh, especially if it turns out that those rights actually belong to that party. And so again, drilling particularly was uh, um, thought to be contrary to international law. And however, seismic surveys were not um, still not uh, ordered to be suspended. Okay. In the South China Sea Arbitration Award, note that the additional uh, guidance we get no, is with respect to some of the, sub the submissions of the Philippines that um, were concerned with China's protests and actions against Philippine petroleum activities in, three in these areas indicated on the chart. And the activities, the conduct that China had were basically diplomatic statements, statements to the service contractor asserting their claims, and actions by Chinese vessels ordering the survey vessel to halt operations and leave the contract area. The first two uh, actions were not deemed to be in contravention of international law. However, note that in the case of diplomatic communications, no, the presumption was that China was in good acting in good faith. So it may be asked whether in the aftermath of the arbitration, China can still be considered in good faith given that it now is aware that uh, the tribunal has ruled that it has no lawful claim to historic rights over these areas, uh, at least on the Philippine side. Uh, with respect to the second uh, conduct, uh, merely informing uh, the uh, contractor about its claim is also not in contravention of uh, international law. However, there is an indication that it might be in contravention if there is evidence that it tried to induce the contractor uh, to cease operations no, essentially interfere with them and or indicate adverse consequences if they did not uh, comply, if they declined uh, to cease operations or even just requesting them to refrain from operations. So there seems to be the implication that a notification but with an additional inducement or possible threat would be contrary to international law. And then finally with respect to the actual interference with the um, petroleum exploration operations, the, the tribunal is very clear that directly inducing the, the um, uh, exploration vessel to cease operations and to depart using uh, law enforcement vessels was contrary, uh, was a breach of the Philippines' rights uh, to its continental shelf. But again, this was based uh, on, uh, this was uh, reached only because the tribunal was able to make the, the finding that this, um, the continental shelf did pertain to the Philippines. So what can we then uh, derive from this? Uh, this is my last slide. Well, basically, the guidance in assessing, therefore, these activities in the South China Sea uh, can be summarized. No? That there is a duty to undertake negotiations in good faith and try to reach an equitable solution. Parties must be doing this, must be undertaking this. They must avoid the appropriation of natural resources or the infliction of physical damage to the seabed and subsoil and causing permanent prejudice. They should not resort to self-help and threats in doing so. Uh, they should provide information, uh, prior information, and seek the cooperation of the other party at the very least, and do not induce, and they should not induce or interfere or in the, indicate adverse cons consequences in case of non-compliance against the contractors or those uh, entities specifically undertaking these uh, petroleum operations. And lastly, they should not themselves unilaterally impose their own understanding of rights and instead seek 
or use the peaceful modes of dispute settlement provided in yung clause. This provides us basically with the guidance that we can use to assess no, the legitimacy of actions in the South China Sea. But probably one final note uh, that I may mention, this seems, to be, uh, this seems to bode well for the Philippines considering that it is a party to the South China Sea arbitration. It seems that with respect to the other parties, although they may refer to the reasoning of the, the, of the uh, uh, tribunal, no, they do not have the benefit of the binding of tribunal award on, the, on them and the other party. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. A great start to the discussion this afternoon. And thank you for taking us to such practical examples um, and previous uh, experiences. Um, and in particular, for reminding us of the importance of discussion, dialogue, and operating in good faith. Um, so a very interesting start to this, this afternoon's discussion. And now I'd like to call on Dr. Ling Ting Hui, um, Deputy General Secretary of the Taiwanese Society of International Law, Chinese Taipei. You have the floor, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. Good afternoon. And uh, today I, I just uh, share my observation about the uh, tribunal's uh, opinion about the uh, uh, archipelago space lines uh, in the arbitration. Uh, I remember uh, five years ago, and the uh, tribunal said uh, any countries cannot uh, plan. Uh, the secretary uh, using the straight best nice or the archipelag best nice uh, in the uh, secretary area. So uh, I, I think uh, uh, this is very important for uh, uh, in the future so for the claimants to uh, claim their territorial sea best nice in the secretary. And especially, this is some uh, signals for everyone uh, to think more. And uh, it, uh, the straight best I using here is uh, is right or wrong, or maybe we don't have the answer. We don't have the answer, but we can uh, have some brainstorm uh, to think more. Uh, so the tribunal said uh, it cannot agree the secretary islands should be in close the winding uh, system of archipelag or a straight best eyes surrounding the high tide futures of the group and accorded an entitlement of uh, two maritime zones as a single unit. Next. Uh, next slide, okay. Uh, so uh, this is the Philippines archipelago best nice and uh, the sand, the tribunal said, uh, the secretary cannot be used uh, on the uh, archipelago best nice. Even the uh, Philippines is the archipelago state. Uh, but if you use the archipelago space uh, in the secretary, uh, the uh, water to land with the uh, gradually exist the night to one under any single of space time. Next time. And uh, China is not an archipelago state, but China is a continental state. And uh, uh, China's must multiple uh, law uh, uh, use the straight best eyes, uh, but uh, in 1996, uh, Chinese government declared a series of straight best eyes, especially on the coastal and uh, on the parazer. Next slide. Uh, this is the parazer straight best eyes. Uh, so the uh, I I I mean maybe the tribunals. Uh, uh, mention about that, uh, even the mention about the uh, uh, spreadery, but uh, I think uh, uh, mention about the parasite uh, too. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is the Denmark straight best eyes on the uh, uh, Faroe Islands. Uh, next time, and uh, next slide. This is uh, Ecuador, uh, Galapagos Islands straight best eyes. Next slide. Uh, the same is the straight best size. So the tribunal said that maybe uh, international practice uh, used in a straight best time, but he, uh, he still uh, think the respiratory islands uh, cannot use the straight best size. Next slide. Uh, this is why the US. U.S. Uh, US Navy uh, challenged the uh, Parisa Strait Base Nice, and uh, you can see in 2016, 
October 21st, the uh, USS, uh, 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 maybe the uh, two uh, US Navy and the uh, UK's Navy uh, challenge the uh, straight base lines. And uh, uh, they draw the uh, normal base lines or low tide base lines uh, on the uh, uh, operations. Next slide. Next slide. And this is the uh, uh, Diao Yu Tai is a straight base lines. Uh, the PRC is uh, uh, declared it in uh, 2012. Uh, but the uh, water to land is uh, uh, 31 to 1. Uh, so uh, it's uh, exceeded the uh, uh, archipelago water's limit limitations. Uh, next time, next slide. And uh, because Taiwan uh, adapt the uh, uh, normal baseline and the mixed baselines, and uh, you can see uh, in Diao Yu, Diao Yu Tai or Saikaku Islands, uh, Taiwan used the normal baseline, and the uh, Pratas Islands uh, using the uh, two two dash normal baseline and the two dash uh, straight baseline. Uh, we use the mixed uh, baseline, and then the Scarborough the Shore we use the uh, normal baseline. Next. Uh, but for the uh, mainland China, because uh, we are a, a, a very special uh, political relations, so we also uh, have uh, uh, domestic law, uh, municipal laws about the uh, governing relations between the peoples of the Taiwan and the mainland. Uh, mainland. So Article 29 of this law, uh, we uh, create the restrictive waters and the pro prohibit waters. Next. So this is Ito Aba typing islands. We uh, declare the restricted uh, waters and the prohibited waters. Uh, mostly the restricted waters uh, is uh, 6,000 meters and the prohibited waters is 4,000 meters. Next. And this is the Jinmen and the uh, Jinmen Islands, we also use the restrictive and prohibited waters. Next. And the Mazu and the uh, Dongyu and next. Next slide, okay. Uh, Liang Islands and the uh, uh, Uchou Islands uh, also use the restricted and the prohibited waters. So we don't declare the territorial sea Next. And this is the uh, uh, Dong Ding, uh, Dong Ying Island near the Kimen. And uh, you can see the Jinmen and the Mazu locations over there. And because it's in the uh, mainland China's uh, straight base lines, so uh, we don't want to challenge some uh, political uh, issues. So uh, we don't. Uh, declare the territory space lines in Jinmen and Mazu. Next. Uh, this is the size scenarios in 19, uh, 2019. And uh, he has uh, four scenario. One is the uh, using the whole uh, futures and uh, to draw the space line. Uh, but it is the whole futures is uh, existed uh, archipelago. Uh, islands uh, ratio. And the uh, next is the same. Next slide. And the third uh, scenario is to use the high tide features, uh, but the water to land ratio is still uh, exceeded. And uh, the next one is the close, use the closely grouped uh, high tide features, but the same, the, uh, the archipelago or uh, the water to land the ratio is still exceeded the nine to one. Next. So uh, the tribunal quoted Article Seven uh, of the Ankara said that the coastline uh, is deeply intended and cut into. Or if there is a fridge of islands along the coast in its immediate uh, facility. The method of straight baseline drawing appropriate points may be employed in drawing the baseline from which the breadth of the territorial sea is measured. Uh, but especially the uh, drawing of baselines uh, 
uh, straight, straight face dice must not depart to any appreciable extent from the general direction of the coast. And the sea areas lying within the lines must be sufficiently closely linked to the land domain to be subject to the uh, regime of international uh, in, internal waters. Next. Next slide, please. Okay, and the Article 7, uh, items 5 of the convention, oh, no, uh, the, no, not, um, the next, the next minute, okay. Uh, I come back to the, okay. Uh, Article 7, uh, items 5 of the conventions regulated uh, where the method of threat resistance is uh, applicable under paragraph 1. No, please uh, come back. Okay. Uh, account may be taken in determining particular baselines of economic interest uh, peculiar to the region concerned the uh, reality and the importance of which are clearly evidenced uh, by long usage. So the criteria provided in the conventions concern the geographical and the economic test. So a question that may arise in where the coastal state can apply the uh, method of straight based answer, sorry, on the basis of economic of the economic and or geographical element. Uh, in the uh, Angra Norway's visually cast in nineteen fifty one. Uh, the ICJ uh, said uh, the economic interests are not the only reason to justify the use of straight baseline. But the next uh, debatable issues relates to the ambiguity of the crit criteria for drawing straight baselines identifying deeply in indented cost or a fringe of islands. Next. Um, Dr. Ling, I might just ask you if you could perhaps um, start to wrap up as we've already gone over your 10 minutes and hopefully there'll be time for further questions okay. to expand your points later. Thank you. But I'll give you a minute to, okay. to wrap up. Thank you. Okay, so I said the uh, conclusions and then uh, next, next slide. I think it is the next slide. Okay, uh, the ICJ's view uh, in many cases, especially in Kota Bari case, also stated that the method of straight based size, which is an exception to the normal rules for the determination of base size, may only be applied if a number of uh, conditions are met. Uh, this method must be applied restrictively. So my conclusion is in contrast to the straight base size and article and the archipelagic best dice. The original normal best dice seemed proper for islands in the South China Sea. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Lin. Um, and thank you for taking us to such a specific example of um, the application of the arbitral ruling on archipelagic baselines. Um, you have made some very interesting points and um, let's hope we get some questions from the floor to draw those out. Um, I'd now like to invite Professor Nishimoto Kentaro from the Tohoku University. Um, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, in my talk for uh, the next 10 minutes, I would like to point uh, to the issue uh, that there seems to be an uh, emerging uh, difference of views uh, between China and other states uh, with regard uh, to the role of one clause uh, in providing the legal framework uh, for the South China Sea. Uh, this is an issue that is uh, illustrated uh, by uh, the exchange of views that China and other states have um, conducted uh, in the form of um, exchange of NOPA routes uh, in relation to the submission of Malaysia uh, to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf uh, in 2019. And uh, this development should be very familiar uh, to all of uh, you having an interest uh, in South China Sea mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. and, I, I, and uh, I understand there was a session uh, in last year's conference uh, referring uh, to it as the notes per debate. 
And this so-called debate uh, was sparked uh, by China's objection uh, to the submission in Malaysia and resulted in a situation uh, where a not large number of states, uh, including uh, those from outside the region that you see on the slide, uh, sent notes uh, in response to uh, the one uh, from China. And China had responded uh, to uh, these notes and all of the notes are now in public domain. And the notes addressed uh, specific issues uh, concerning the interpretation of UNCLOS, uh, such as the validity of historic rights claims uh, or the drawing of streets base baselines around offshore archipelago as just discussed by the previous speaker. And uh, many of the notes also expressed concerns about China's non-compliance with the award. And although this development was in response uh, to the specific submission by Malaysia, we can regard this development as reflective of the role that the arbitral award has played in providing a reference point uh, for understanding the legal order uh, in the South China Sea. And uh, while the debate relates to many different specific issues regarding the law of the sea, uh, I would like to focus on the fact that in the more recent notes, uh, China has been emphasizing its view that UNCLOS does not provide a comprehensive legal order for the oceans, and that UNCLOS has continuously uh, been uh, improved and developed. And I have now on the slide uh, the note from China, which was sent uh, in response to the notes from the UK, uh, Germany, and France. Uh, here we see that China does attach importance to UNCLOS uh, by stating that China treats UNCLOS with a rigorous and responsible attitude, and also by saying that all parties should faithfully, comprehensively, and correctly interpret and apply the rules of the law of the sea including UNCLOS in an objective and just manner. However, we also see that the reference here is to the law of the sea, including UNCLOS uh, in the sentence that I just referred to. In addition, uh, there is the explicit statement that UNCLOS does not cover everything about the maritime order. And to support this argument, uh, China refers to paragraph eight uh, of the preamble of UNCLOS, uh, which provides that matters not regulated by this convention uh, continue to be governed by the rules and principles of general uh, international law. And there is also a statement uh, near the bottom of the paragraph uh, saying that uh, UNCLOS has continuously developed and improved and that the ongoing negotiations for the BBNG agreement is an important effort uh, for the development and uh, improvement of UNCLOS. And uh, if we take a look at China's notes in the order that they were issued, it seems that China initially did not make such sweeping statements about the role of international law other than UNCLOS. Of course, China had been referring to, uh, for example, international law, including UNCLOS, and UNCLOS and general international law in relation to its maritime claims, and also in relation uh, to the drawing of straight baselines in closing archipelagos, uh, presumably based on their argument that customary international law provides justification uh, for these claims. Uh, in contrast, the reference to general international law in the note in the previous slide was not about a particular legal issue, about the legal framework itself. And I see this as a very uh, important development as general international law, uh, when used in this manner, uh, can be used as a backdoor to allow arguments that are plainly contrary to UNCLOS, uh, perhaps by inventing uh, rules of customary international law. And as a matter of law, uh, these arguments on general international law and also on the improvement, uh, so so-called improvement of UNCLOS, are difficult to justify. And in this regard, it is very interesting to see uh, that the most recent note uh, from New Zealand uh, in August uh, 2021 directly addresses these issues in addition to other specific issues concerning the interpretation of UNCLOS and China's non-compliance with the award. Uh, the note states that New Zealand underscores the universal and unified character of UNCLOS and also states that UNCLOS was intended to settle all issues relating to the law of the sea, uh, which is referring to another paragraph also contained uh, in the preamble. And there is also a very important statement uh, that while matters not regulated by UNCLOS continue to be governed by the rules and principles of international law, this is not relevant to the establishment of maritime zones 
or to the rights and responsibility of states within those zones, which are comprehensively regulated uh, by UNCLOS. And further on the issue of improvement of UNCLOS, it is pointed out that multilateral agreements relating uh, to the maritime sphere and negotiated subsequently to UNCLOS broadly implement and are consistent uh, with UNCLOS and do not derogate uh, from the overarching rules that UNCLOS provides. And so as stated uh, in New Zealand's notes in a very clear manner, UNCLOS contains clear rules on maritime entitlements. And it was precisely the finding of the arbitral award that UNCLOS provides a comprehensive legal regime for the EEZ, superseding any historic rights claims. And moreover, although uh, the UNCLOS regime may be under continuous development uh, such as, uh, through such steps as the negotiation of, of implementing agreements, uh, such processes are collective efforts uh, for the formulation of rules that are consistent uh, with the overall framework uh, of UNCLOS. So uh, in this way, China's arguments aimed at devaluing the constitutional role of UNCLOS for the, the maritime order uh, do not seem to have much merit and do not appear to have any chance of attracting support from other states. However, it needs to be pointed out that such arguments uh, may have a serious implications uh, for the legal order of the South China Sea as it raises questions uh, regarding China's commitment to the rules contained in UNCLOS. Of course, it is the reality of international society that states may have very different views concerning the interpretation of a convention uh, or the rules that apply to certain situations. Uh, but I believe it is quite rare for a state to downplay the significance of a very commonly accepted legal regime uh, or uh, to hint that what enjoys very wide support is in some way deficient and is in need of so-called improvement or further development. Uh, the note for Valves uh, I addressed uh, show uh, that there is wide international support uh, for uh, maritime legal order uh, based on UNCLOS. And such support is also reflected uh, in the annual Oceans and uh, the Law of the Sea a resolution adopted uh, by the United Nations General Assembly. And so all party to UNCLOS have an obligation, as China actually has stated in its note, uh, to faithfully, comprehensively, correctly interpret and apply uh, the rules of the Law of the Sea. However, the law of the sea not only includes UNCLOS, uh, but uh, is centered uh, on UNCLOS. And I hope uh, this is the way forward uh, for the future of the South China Sea. And uh, with that, I would like to end my presentation. Uh, thank you uh, very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor, and thank you um, for keeping to time, but presenting such a succinct outline of the role of the award in prompting a deeper analysis of the role of UNCLOS um, and for your conclusion that um, there is a, a common international position, which is that maritime legal order is based on UNCLOS, uh, regardless of different interpretations that um, are around. Now, um, it gives me great pleasure to now introduce Dr. Yan Yan, Director of the Research Oceans Law and Policy at the National Institute for South China Sea Studies. And we are very much looking forward to hearing your perspectives, Dr. Yan Yan. Thank you, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Chair. Let me, uh, first of all, let me uh, share my screen. Um, wait a minute, I'm sorry. Um, uh, um, I think that there might be a, a little problem with my... I'm sorry, let me just check again. Oh my God, I... Uh... May 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 I may I try later and then you can let the next speaker to uh, yeah. I'm sorry, um, sorry, it's just no. Thank you. Thank you. These things happen. Um, so I don't want to put you on the spot, uh, Andrew. But if you are ready to speak, I can certainly give you the floor. Um, Andrew Murdoch, legal director from the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office, will speak next, and then we'll go back to Dr. Yan Yan. Are you there, Andrew? Yeah, hi, just, right. just unmuting. Uh, no, that's absolutely fine. Um, so uh, very good to uh, join you uh, today for this conference. Um, so I, I'm going to raise the issue of uh, state responsibility in, in this context and drawing on some of the issues raised in the arbitral award. 
So let's start with the warships and government vessels on non-commercial service, uh, as we know, play an important role in maintaining order in the maritime environment. Uh, as we know, they're afforded uh, special powers within the convention to deal with, for example, piracy and rights of visit. And other conventions have drawn on that framework uh, and given them special uh, powers and enforcement abilities, such as the Drug Trafficking Convention, Sewer, Migrant Smuggling Protocol and others. And they also attract sovereign immunity, as we know, as a matter of custom international law and as provided for in the convention. Those ships uh, also have uh, rights provided for them, as we know, in innocent passage, transit passage, freedom of navigation in the high seas, archipelagic sea lane, sea lane passage. But the convention, as we know, the package deal uh, provides for a very careful balance and imposes certain conditions on the exercise of those rights, uh, including for warships and those government vessels. So, for example, in the territorial sea, uh, they have to ensure that they do, uh, do not operate with prejudicial to the peace, uh, good order and security of the coastal state. And of course, the compliance by warship with relevant coastal state laws relating to that innocent passage, including generally accepted international reg regulations relating to the prevention of collisions at sea. And I'll come on to that. Transit passage. We know that they have to operate in normal modes, uh, continuous and expeditious passage. Uh, and then there's the obligation reflected in Article 2.4 of the UN Charter on no threat or use of force against the coastal states bordering the straits. In the EZ, due regard obligations to the rights and duties of coastal states. And on the high seas, again, the due regard to the interests of other states in their exercise of the, co of the freedoms of the high seas. What the award did was an important uh, articulation of uh, uh, an aspect of the convention, Article 94 of the convention. Um, this concerns uh, the relevant responsibilities of flag states, and in particular, uh, the responsibility for states, the conduct of warships and state vessels. So uh, Article 94, for those that don't have a, a, a photographic memory, um, Article 94.1, uh, requires flag states to effectively exercise their jurisdiction and control in administrative, technical and social matters over ships flying their flag. Subsection three uh, goes on to clarify the scope of that duty um, to ensure to, and take measures as are necessary to ensure the safety at sea, including measures amongst others, the use of signals, the maintenance of communications and the prevention of collisions. The precise scope of those obligation is clarified in subsection five, and this is important. It says in taking the measures called for in paragraph three, each state is required to conform to generally accepted international regulations, procedures, practices, and to take any steps which may be necessary to secure their observance. So coal regs, this is the collision uh, uh, regulations, 162 contracting parties representing more than 98% of the world's tonnage. A violation of coal regs uh, is, as a generally accepted international rela uh, regulation, concerns the measures necessary to ensure maritime safety, therefore constitutes a violation of the, of the convention. And this was the important link that was set out in the award the fact that these detailed regulations and accepted standards, violations of which in this area and safety at sea are a direct link to substantive obligations set out in the convention. So if we look back at the, uh, the award um, and look at some of the behaviors the, uh, uh, the, the tribunal looked at, they looked at, for example, high speed maneuvering in close vicinity to other vessels, veering at close distances, where uh, momentary decision-making lapses could lead to catastrophic collisions. There was also the risk of collisions, where there is one, sorry, risk of collisions, uh, and uh, there is an obligation to give way under those regulations. Vessels are obliged to take timely actions to keep clear, to obviously maintain a safe distance. And other actions, for example, of high-speed blocking maneuvers, attempting to cut across the bows of other ships at very close proximity. What the tribunal did, having uh, found that, or as a factual matter that these uh, incidents had happened, and these were the conduct of Chinese vessels, uh, they were in breach, a direct breach of the collision regulations. They were effectively official acts of China because those vessels fell directly under the command and control of the Chinese government. 
As such, the tribunal found the conduct in question to be automatically attributable to China. Establishing state responsibility then in this manner for breaches of the collision regulations and by implication, of course, other accepted international regulations is an important development in maintaining order at sea and ensuring the safety of ships and crews. And of course, in the South China Sea's award, some vessels were clearly state vessels belonging to state uh, administrative uh, organizations. But the law of state responsibility as a matter of general international law goes a bit further than that. Without going through all the various uh, permutations, which we know are set out in the International Law Commission's draft articles of state responsibilities, if vessels are acting under the instructions of or under the direction of control of a state in carrying out the conduct, they also attract state responsibility. And so this obligation, as we've seen and under uh, uh, Nart 94 of the Convention, bringing in the Convention, uh, sorry, the collision regulations, applies not just to state vessels, but all those other types of vessels which are effectively under the direction or control of a state. Those could be otherwise described as private fishing vessels and other commercial vessels that are effectively being directed by the state in their activities. Now, since the award, um, as we know, uh, the behaviour of certain states in terms of their activity and harassment and other dangerous activity at sea in terms of uh, interfering improperly with the, uh, the, the safe and lawful passage of other baits has not ceased. And so the le reasoning in the award provides a basis for states to respond if they so wish. And as we know, there are a range of options available to states to do this. At the one end of respect, of course, you have the, the diplomatic uh, uh, protests, written, verbal, public or otherwise. But of course, the convention, as we know, provides other tools available to that state. Article 94.6, for example, uh, provides a basis that where a state believes that a state has not exercised that jurisdiction properly in Article 94, then it can report those facts to the flag state, who is then under an obligation to investigate the matter and if appropriate, take action necessary to respond to the remedy. That is a substantive normative, normative obligation on the state to do that. And where, for example, there has been a, an incident of navigation causing a loss of life or serious injury, or serious damage to ships, there is a further obligation for an inquiry to be held under Article 94.7. Uh, and, in, and in terms of that, a slightly more uh, prescriptive uh, method in terms of carrying out. And as we know, not just the substantive obligation in 94, but also those procedural ones as well that I've just outlined, could give rise to dispute settlement, compute compulsory dispute settlement uh, provisions, as has been uh, uh, taken in the arbitral award. And of course, where there are uh, uh, declarations excluding compulsory dispute uh, settlement or uh, uh, recommendations, uh, sorry, uh, obligations, uh, those may not necessarily be that relevant uh, where the activity is not uh, uh, found within the nature of and confined to that optional declaration, for example, the kind of military activities. Of course, there is also the International Maritime Organization uh, and uh, regard could be had to what methods uh, and options can be included there in terms of IMO audits or other processes and procedures to bring that to the attention of the IMO. In conclusion, I wouldn't necessarily limit it to the, what you've got in the current jurisprudence in terms of those issues of state responsibility, but thought may be had to where the uh, advisory opinion of the uh, of it loss in 2015 uh, could be taken. And this regard, had regard to obligations of flag states beyond those vessels that they have uh, uh, state responsibility over, but, but more importantly, that all their vessels entitled to fly their flag. And this would, of course, require flag states to deploy adequate measures and means to use their best efforts through their necessary administrative measures to ensure all their vessels do not breach coal rates with associated appropriate sanctions for breaches. And that is an area, I think, of developing jurisprudence that we may well see. Uh, thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, very comprehensive account of um, how the awards provided a, a wider range of options for responses to states' behaviour and the impact it will have on um, international jurisprudence. So a very useful summary, thank you. And now I'm um, going back to Dr. Yan Yan um, and uh, you're welcome to take the floor again and we have your screen up before us now, thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. I hope it works this time. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, um, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizer for inviting me to this year's conference again. Uh, it's my uh, maybe three, four times of participating in this conference. And honestly, I do like the uh, sub theme of today, of this year's um, conference. Uh, look back and uh, look back for a brighter future. So, um, well, uh, today I will start with the uh, uh, with exploring the uh, how we can achieve a brighter future by looking back the South China Sea in the past five years. I will uh, I will look at the uh, the uh, the legal order, uh, the uh, the rules and the state practice in the back back uh, five years, and also to see how we can work for a. For the brighter future to echo the uh, theme of the uh, of the conference. Well, first of all, I would like like to say that I would like to uh, uh, comment a little bit on my the previous speaker, uh, Professor um, Cantalo's uh, comment on China's saying that China devaluating devaluating the road of the UNCLOS. Well, um, honestly, I personally, as a legal scholar, I won't. Um, undermine the uh, the huge contribution of the UNCLOS has made of the peaceful human use of the ocean, and it does establish a new international marine legal order and provides a basic legal framework for human uses of the maritime space and conducting maritime activities. However, it is often a common knowledge to uh, to to know that the UNCLOS. It's a package deal. Thus, it has many vague and ambiguous language. And there also exist many um, vacancies and that requires um, other countries and regional uh, arrangements to fill in. And that's why, uh, that's where I wanted to start with today's uh, presentation and to, um, uh, to uh, get how to guarantee a brighter future. I personally think that only the UNCLOS is not enough. We do have the, the baseline clause, the Article 7483, Article 121, Article 123. They're all highly relevant to the South China Sea dispute and the South China Sea um, region. However, we still uh, need uh, detailed arrangements of our region by the countries of our own to fill in the gap. To, uh, to create our own state practice to guarantee a brighter future. Well, so far we have the 1976 Treaty of Amity and the Cooperation, we have the uh, DOC, we have the COC, and we also, all the uh, ASEAN member states and China signed the uh, Code of Encounters, the, the Qs, uh, back in 2014. I think these um, regional arrangements are our practice to fill in the gap where uh, UNCLOS left. Um, Okay, and then next, um, let's look at the, uh, um, the South China Sea in the past five years. It's my personal uh, feeling that from the session this morning, um, the uh, opening session, session one and session two, it makes me feel that China is everything to blame in the South China Sea, that China is the uh, 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 China is uh, everything China do is it's wrong and it makes the South China Sea um, in, in, in tension. But if we look at the um, uh, look look back these five years, we see uh, we touch upon these very core issues of the South China Sea dispute, which is the territorial sovereignty dispute. We see that even with the uh, arbitral tribunal's ruling in place. Uh, it doesn't matter what, whether China's position um, is uh, accepted or not. The, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the problems, the disputes of the sovereignty still remains unresolved. Well, China's position is pretty clear that it does not think the court has jurisdiction over the case, and thus it won't accept or uh, uh, recognize the ruling. And I don't want to repeat that because that position is consistent and it won't change in the future. But now I really wanted to have a whole picture of the last five years um, South China Sea situation. And the first thing I wanted to say here is that territorial sovereignty dispute remained unresolved. But we do see some um, efforts made 
by coastal states of the South China Sea trying to, um, uh, to fill that up, like the bilateral consultative mechanism established uh, in the year 2017. And then uh, we have uh, uh, already conducted seven meetings between China and the Philippines. And that is the bilateral way of negotiating how to deal with the disputes that are the real disputes among the two states. And also on the outer side of the maritime jurisdiction dispute, we see in the past five years, uh, conflicts generated from the competition of resources, including fisheries resources and oil and gas resources are rising. Um, we also see some efforts in this area that uh, like the uh, joint and development and oil and gas exploration cooperation between China and the Philippines, the MOU we have signed on 2018 are all in this on, in, this, uh, in, in this level. And also we see on the other side, those less sensitive areas and also the navigational issues that most of the extra regional countries are concerned with are, uh, are still there. And we see that during the past five years, there are more extra regional countries involved. We see, uh, we see um, uh, Germany, in British, uh, UK, um, France, all send their warships to navigate through the South China Sea. And uh, I don't think China has an, an interfered with any of their, in, uh, of their um, navigation when they're traveling through the South China Sea. So therefore, um, here, I wanted to say that even with the arbitration ruling in place, the fundamental dispute of the South China Sea still remains unresolved. Uh, Dr. Yang, we think we've lost you. You may need to refresh your screen. We'll just pause the clock while we get this um, issue sorted out. Dr. Yan Yan, if you can hear us, we're just trying to resolve this technical issue. We hope to have you back very shortly. Hello, Chair. I'm Yan Yan's colleague. I'm from NASIS. Yes. Uh, there is some problem with her internet, and uh, the technical guys are working on it. Great. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We'll just give you a minute. Um, if necessary, we'll move on to our discussant and come back for Dr. Okay, Yan Yan to finish. Thank you. Okay, well, unfortunately, we're having to wait a little while. Um, if uh, I can just check with the organisers, I might just turn to our discussant um, and then we'll go back to Yan Yan to finish her comments. Um, but before I do so, um, and we were interrupted in the middle of a very interesting presentation and we may have her back, just let's see. Not yet. Okay, um, so perhaps... Sorry, I'm sharing my screen. You're back. Am I? Great. That's Welcome okay. back. We look forward to hearing the rest of your presentation and we've stopped the clock. So you still have around about four minutes to speak. Sorry, I don't know where I left, but uh, but uh, okay, just this PowerPoint. I think that most serious conflicts in the South China Sea for the past five years doesn't even involve the Chinese people. Like for example, last August, um, there is a serious conflict between uh, Malaysia law enforcement um, agency and the Vietnamese fishermen, and 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 they have uh, a used force and caused one Vietnam fisherman die. And also between uh, Vietnam and the Indonesia, there's a serious uh, several uh, conflicts on this um, fishing issue. And also uh, uh, there are more than 200, I think around 200 uh, Vietnam fishermen were detained by the Indonesia uh, law enforcement agencies back in the past two, three years. But we also see several incidents involve China. Like uh, for example, last 
of April, uh, Vietnam uh, fishing boat bombing to a Chinese Coast Guard uh, vessel in the parasols. And also uh, we see the US-China warship has a close encounter back in the year 2018. So look at all these uh, uh, conflicts and in the South China Sea in the past five years, I do think that all the coastal states have their share of responsibility. Um, it's not only China to blame. And also I'll be really brief here to look at what US involvement in the South China Sea. We have been talking a lot about this in the previous sessions. I think the US have already involved from the military uh, field, diplomacy, law, economy, and everything everything here um so uh it's a, it's a, it's a one of the main challenges in the south china sea and also uh we have some positive progress in the south china sea as well in the past 5 years under this article 123 of unclos and also the 2002 um, doc we have joint sar exercises bilateral consultative me uh, mechanisms we also china asean and us asean all conducted naval drills together uh, so um, these are the security uh, security cooperation that we have in the region. And also, uh, if we look at the uh, COC negotiation, uh, well, actually, since 2013, to, since 2013 we achieved uh, quite uh, a fast pace uh, back in the years. But uh, it's a pity that due to the pandemic that the, uh, the, the negotiation was postponed. But luckily, this year, we held the, uh, in June, we held a face-to-face -face negotiation in Chongqing. And I think that the second reading is now ongoing. So looking for a brighter future, how can we guarantee a brighter future. Does unclause is enough for a brighter future? Well, I personally do not uh, think it is enough. Well, I never undermine the uh, UNCLOS contribution to human use of the maritime zones, but um, uh, of the ocean. However, I think that in in international law itself, together with the regional arrangements such as DOC and COC, um, can help all together to bring us to a, a better future. And also to deal with the uh, the uh, the uh, basic and the uh, fundamental dispute, which is the territorial dispute of the South China Sea. We still need direct, nego direct negotiations of the con of the parties directly involved. And finally, I really wanted to say that um, pointing a finger to each other won't help to achieve a brighter future. And also pointing all your fingers to China will be even worse. So I really look forward for all these three mechanisms to work together to help us to bring, it, to, to bring us into this brighter future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yan Yan. It's uh, good to hear from you. And thank you for bringing those perspectives to the discussion. Um, and in particular, reminding us of um, different perspectives on how um, the award is perceived, how it inter intersects with other processes in the region, and also the complex range of issues um, which continue to shape the discussions that we're having, not least of which, of course, is the impact of COVID on, um, on discussions in the last two years. So thank you for that. So um, before I turn to our discussion, um, just to uh, summarise that this afternoon we've heard from our speakers about a wide range um, of issues in the legal framework that governs the actions of states in our oceans and seas. Um, it's been a very useful and dynamic set of presentations which have taken us from practical references to petroleum activities in um, which provide a snapshot of, of concerns in the South China Sea. Um, through to the awards application um, to the use of archipelagic uh, baselines and how this um, has been applied in the last five years. We've also tracked across a consideration of whether the award has put the centrality of UNCLOS at stake with a, a fairly clear um, conclusion from our presenter that it has not. Um, and then onto a consideration of how the awards provided a wider range of options for responses to states behavior um, and the impact of this on the development of international jurisprudence. And then finally, um, a different set of perspectives on how the award interacts with other processes and discussions in the region. So a very rich start to our discussion. Um, and now I'd like to invite our discussant, um, Associate Dean Joanna Mossop from the Law Faculty at Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand to make some comments and we'll then move to questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ambassador. Um, we've been very lucky indeed to hear from four great experts today all with very different perspectives on the law of the sea convention, uh, sorry, the law of the sea, the South China Sea arbitral decision. I think if there's one thread that runs through all these papers is the 
recognition that there are very serious differences of opinion among states, and not just about the interpretation of UNCLOS, but even the role of UNCLOS itself in the dispute. Now, that first type of dispute about the interpretation of UNCLOS rules was, of course, anticipated by the negotiators of the convention. And this is the key reason for the inclusion of part 15 of UNCLOS, which provides for both voluntary and compulsory forms of dispute settlement. Part 15 was subject to a lot of discussion, and in the end, the goal of peaceful resolution of disputes was seen as so important, the negotiators made the courageous decision to allow some categories of dispute to be subject to compulsory jurisdiction. Um, make no mistake, this was a carefully negotiated set of provisions, and importantly, it was agreed to by all the participants at the conference. History um, up to that point had shown the potential chaos caused by bitter disputes over the content of the law of the sea. And so one of the important legacies of the negotiations was the ability for states to take another state to third party dispute settlement if they believe the state has violated UNCLOS. One consequence of this is that the balance of power was taken out of the disputes under the law of the sea. The smaller state could bring a case against the most powerful in a neutral forum. It's also important to note that some disputes are excluded from compulsory jurisdiction. Um, however, um, international law clearly states that the decision of the tribunal, so long as it has jurisdiction, is binding on the two parties to the dispute. And tribunals and courts have what is known as competence de la competence, that is, it's up to the tribunal to determine which, ma which matters are within its competence. And most states have accepted that approach. China's refusal to appear in the South China Sea arbitration, plus its apparent determination to pull away from any recognition of the binding nature of compulsory cases, puts a key part of the convention at risk. I've heard Chinese academics and diplomats arguing, for example, that consent is an important part and necessary for any case to proceed. Of course, this ignores the fact that by ratifying UNCLOS, it has already given consent to the entire convention, including the dispute settlement clauses. And of course, this is how um, we have compulsory dispute settlement clauses in other treaties as well. What does concern me as an international lawyer is uh, the idea that a state with economic and military power can uh, seek to rewrite rules um, that they disagree with. Now, I'm the last person to argue that UNCLOS is perfect. Of course it's not. But UNCLOS was a deal that was negotiated as part of a package precisely to prevent any picking and choosing um, that may, may arise. So what does this mean for dispute settlement under the law of the sea? Has the tribunal undermined the stability of the dispute settlement regime? On the one hand, the decision is a rich source of law on a range of subjects, and those um, topics have already been discussed on this panel today. It has certainly kept law of the sea lawyers employed for a while. On the other hand, the decision has um, made China feel under attack, and, and this has led to a sense of grievance that has motivated China in seeking to ensure the system is better aligned to its view of international law, especially in a part of the ocean that China sees as its backyard. And um, I somehow wonder whether the tribunal had sufficient regard to the political context of the dispute. Would I prefer it that China respected the decision of the tribunal? Of course. Does the failure of agreement on a particular matter lead to the undermining of international law? Of course it doesn't. In many areas of the law, there is no ability to take a matter to compulsory dispute settlement and political and diplomatic skills are brought to bear. However, I do think that in the past five years, the law of the sea has been more tested than at any time since the convention was negotiated. UNCLOS was meant to bring an end to contestation over the basic rules of the law of the sea. And for the most part, it has been successful. And one hopes that this current dispute does not unravel what was a remarkable achievement. Thank you, Ambassador.
Thank you very much, Dr. Mossop. Um, and uh, I think probably Emma, a defter roundup of the discussion that I was able to give, but thank you for, um, for highlighting all of those points. And now um, I'd like to open the floor for questions. We have about um, 25 minutes remaining, and I'm sure there are many questions both here on site and also on the screen. Um, but I'd like first to turn to the room that we're sitting in. Um, I understand we have some well-informed commentators who may wish to pose questions. So could I ask you first to raise your hand in the room here, and then we'll start to look at um, questions coming in online and from the other rooms. And we may need to turn online. Yes, we do have a question, uh, Ms. Lanang. Um, thank you, Chair. I'd like to have two questions. My first question going to Jay. Um, uh, if the activities that cause physical damage exist, continue to exist in the South China Sea, according to um, the cited juridic prudence that you put in your presentation, what are the options, the legal option for the little state in the South China Sea, please? And my second question go to LinkedIn. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned about the um, restricted and prohibited waters. Um, to what extent the water um, are in line with um, archipelagic water uh, provided in Article 49 of UNCLOS? And the second part of the question for LinkedIn, um, if setting aside the sovereignty issue regarding e 2 um, if I'm uh, correctly uh, seeing your map, um, I saw only the restricted and prohibited water um, demonstrated in the map. That that mean that um, Taiwan, in the same view that e 2 aba doesn't have EEZ, please. Uh, Professor, would you like to respond? Yes, sorry. Sorry, I thought there would be another one. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, just to answer the question. Uh, thank you, uh, Lana, and good to see you as well. Um, um, well, the, the tribunal's uh, decisions, of course, um, mostly stop at that point of uh, declaring uh, whether these activities no, uh, could be deemed as uh, possibly wrongful or unlawful. Uh, that implies that if they are, uh, these are that if these are activities are undertaken, then um, I think this is also connected with one of our speakers' uh, um, um, comments earlier, then it implies that the state which has uh, carried out a wrongful activity would bear international responsibility for whatever consequences arise from that. So theoretically, the coastal state which suffered the damage could uh, pursue uh, reparations perhaps or could engage the dispute settlement processes under UNCLOS and I think most of the uh, comments on the jurisprudence indicate that really the, the first recourse really should be uh, um, towards those dispute uh, settlement mechanisms so naturally it will give them cause to enter into negotiations to demand uh, uh, compliance with obligations uh, and then that also means that if negotiations are success are not successful then they could resort to the uh, corresponding uh, compulsory dispute settlement mechanisms if necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, we now have a question um, online from Captain Shi Shen Tian. Um, please. Thank you, Chair, for giving the opportunity. Uh, Captain Tian from the uh, Global Governance Institution, based here in China. My question goes to uh, uh, my friend Murdoch, uh, Mr. Murdoch from UK. Um, you mentioned about the obligations of the uh, uh, states in terms of the uh, uh, worships of public vessels. So my question is, if the worship is acting in self-defense function, or if the pub public vessel is acting in function of law enforcement action, does this have to respect the obligation of COREX in terms of uh, with the the, uh, the the criminal worship uh, criminal vessels. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Would you like to respond? Yes, thank you very much, and good to see you again, Captain. Um, I think, in terms of the, it very much depends on the circumstances. We've seen it in uh, public vessels carrying out law enforcement activities, and I think there's a difference between kind of 
self-defense and law enforcement activities, depending on the legal framework, um, then, you know, all actions should still be taken to uh, regards to kind of uh, the minimum necessary action and making sure it's proportionate. And that could well be uh, reflective of the kind of uh, safety at life at sea issues in terms of how much force is used and the normal boarding requirements. But of course, if you're carrying out law enforcement activities, sometimes they will obviously involve carrying out boardings and the like, which aren't necessarily the things that you would normally expect to be carrying out with ships at sea that generally trying to avoid each other. So I think, yes, the, the, the rules in terms of would be adapted to carrying out legitimate law enforcement activities uh, at sea, while still having that overarching principle that the actions uh, taken have to be necessary and proportionate and with due regard to principles of humanity. And we've seen that in some of the jurisprudence of the, of the tribunal early on in the MV Saiga case, where they looked at the, um, uh, the rules on use of force. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Now, I must apologise. Um, I didn't direct uh, Ms Lanang's second question to Dr Lin Ting Hui. So there was a second part to the question. Dr Lin, if you would like to respond. Yes, uh, thank, thanks, Ed Lanang, and uh, very easy to answer. Uh, the first question is, uh, uh, our restrictive and uh, prohibited waters is just for a million Chinese people and not for foreigners. So uh, it's based on the defense reasons and uh, uh, just uh, think about the uh, defense uh, factors. So that uh, for about the uh, uh, territorial sea or uh, the, the EEZ or the uh, contiguous zone. So uh, if we uh, want to declare uh, uh, some areas uh, of the restrictive uh, waters or prohibited waters, uh, maybe in the future we will based on our territorial sea law or the uh, uh, contingent uh, territorial sea and the contiguous zones law. Uh, but uh, if uh, currently we just uh, uh, pro uh, prohibit of uh, uh, mainland China's uh, fishermen or the people that enter into these areas. And uh, Itu Aba is very uh, special because uh, we just only declare the uh, prohibit area, uh, prohibit waters and the restricted waters, not uh, declare the territorial sea over there. Even we, we, we don't, we didn't uh, declare the territorial sea baseline over there. So that's why we always think about if we face the uh, Vietnam, Vietnam fishermen or the meet uh, 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 your face the uh, uh, Malaysia fishermen, so how we can do over there because maybe uh, some uh, legal or uh, illegal problems over there. So uh, currently, just for uh, defense reasons, so uh, the uh, prohibit and the restricted waters uh, not to, to uh, declare the. Uh, sovereignty or the uh, sovereign rights over there uh, just uh, for the uh, defense reasons. So uh, I think uh, for my personal view, uh, I respect the tribunals said, uh, maybe Itu Aba have no right to declare the EEZ or continental shelf, but uh, our government have uh, uh, have a formal uh, responsibility, no acceptance over there. But, but I, I think the uh, tribunals said, well, uh, 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 well, we'll uh, show the, uh, their, their opinion and their view and uh, maybe we'll create some uh, custom international in the future. Uh, so we need more uh, cases, we need more arbitration cases. So that's why we always uh, think about uh, just like the Japanese Okinotori relief that uh, we want uh, uh, just like the uh, Marshall Islands to, uh, uh, to uh, to, to figure out uh, the cases about uh, uh, to challenge the Okinatori uh, uh, reef uh, status, legal status. But uh, I think uh, it's not uh, very uh, easy for that uh, because I, uh, the, the, the arbitration cases naturally uh, developed uh, uh, when some uh, uh, states or some countries have their legal problems. But, uh, but currently, we just the only one cases is to say it up I have no this sovereign rights. So I think in the future we can uh we can see uh the brighter futures that uh, maybe 
uh, uh, E2Alpha have uh, rights or not, maybe uh, my personal views, uh, I think I, 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 I respect the uh, tribunal said, but uh, our government have some procedures over there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we have a question in the room, I believe, Madam, on the left, conference room three. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Viet Hà from the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam, and I have a uh, question. I'm to... sorry, I was just inviting, uh, we have a participant in the main conference room who has just taken the microphone, and then we'll go to conference room three. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, my question was uh, similar to Lanang's question to our colleague from Taiwan, and uh, I, I, I um, find it uh, okay with his answer. But I have a further comment relating to the comment from our colleague from China. She said that the, uh, the uh, award of the arbitral uh, tribunal in the case between the Philippines and China did not help at all to settle any disputes in the South China Sea, uh, including the uh, territorial sovereignty uh, disputes, the disputes over fishing and uh, oil and petroleum uh, exploration and exploitation, and even uh, the uh, travel, the, the, the passage of warships into the South China Sea. My comment is that uh, our colleague from China seems to read too much into the jurisdiction of the arbitration. Uh, actually, the case is only a case of uh, interpretation and uh, 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 interpretation of, of the uh, some of the um, uh, articles of the UNCLOS relating to uh, um, uh, maritime in, um, uh, uh, entitlement and also uh, relating to some of the China's uh, of the Chinese activities in the South China Sea. And uh, of sorry course, to interrupt. Um, can I just ask, are you going to put a question to Dr. No, Yang? No, no, uh, I'm making yeah. a comment. This is not a question. Uh, thank you. I just want to uh, to comment on, on the comment made by our colleague from China. Uh, so uh, I think the award of the arbitral tribunal uh, would make a very good contribution to uh, the um, issue of the South China Sea if the parties to the case, uh, including China, uh, um, uh, implement the award uh, relating to uh, historic uh, rights, uh, uh, relating to... Uh, um, maritime entitlement and uh, relating to the way baselines uh, for the offshore archipelagos should be uh, should be uh, determined, uh, and if those uh, uh, conclusions of the um, uh, tribunal uh, are implemented, there would be a, a, a very good chance for the disputes of uh, the use of the maritime areas mm. in the South China Sea to have a very good legal basis to settle, Thank to be settled. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Um, and could I ask that um, we keep our questions short as we do want to hear from our distinguished panelists as well who have um, given their time to this conference, but thank you for the comment. Um, so now I have a question from Dr. Ding Duo, or Zio, uh, who is on the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Uh, Actually, I have a, 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 sorry. I have a comment to my uh, uh, Japanese colleague, Professor Kina, uh, Kitaro. Uh, you, you have made a, a, a very detailed analysis on the Chinese uh, note uh, to the uh, CLCS, but I think there is a mistake in your uh, logic. You mentioned that the Chinese government emphasis in the international uh, general international law uh, is uh, some kind of devalue, uh, devaluing the rule of convention. But from my view, is uh, uh, just reminding uh, the international community that in addition to the UN clause, general international law 
including customary international law, also regulates uh, maritime matters which are not fall within the ANCOS. And this is also uh, the con consistent with the preamble and the spirit of the, uh, of the convention. That's my commentary on your presentation. Thank you. And another short commentary to uh, Joanna and uh, uh, my uh, Vietnam colleagues. Uh, I think uh, we all know the position of Chinese government on the award of the South China Sea uh, arbitration and the case. But from an academic perspective, the ruling, uh, you mentioned that the, the competence, the competence, I agree with you. But even, even this, the, the uh, Annex 7 arbitral tribunal's competence should not be uh, exceeded its jurisdiction with uh, 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 cited in the ANCLOS. ANCLOS does not regulate matters of territorial sovereignty and the disputes concerning maritime limitation has been excluded from the compulsory procedure by China's statement in uh, 2006. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you commented that Dr. Yan Yan's uh, presentation focused on the jurisdiction issue, but from our view, the jurisdiction is a precondition of the merits. Uh, if we talk about the merits, you talk about the interpretation of the end clause. Uh, for me, the arbitral award is to some extent uh, also was a, a judicial lawmaking activity. If we look at the interpretation to Article 1 to 1, the islands regime, Thank you. Um, thank you for those comments. And I, I am conscious that time is running out and we still have a number of questions um, awaiting, but thank you for bringing those perspectives. Um, could I just invite uh, any of the panelists to respond at this point before I move to conference room three where the young leaders are waiting patiently? Would anyone like to speak from the panel? Uh, Professor Nishimoto. Yeah, perhaps a brief comment uh, with regards to uh, the uh, preamble of one clause, which of course refers to uh, rules of general uh, international law. And so I, I, I think in essence, I, I do agree with the uh, comment made by uh, Dr. Ding Duo. But uh, I think then the issue is what are the matters not regulated by UNCLOS? And I, I think there's a big uh, difference of views on that issue. And I think that will be my comment to uh, the comment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Dr. Yan Yan would like to make a comment. Yes, um, thank you, Chair. Well, can I answer the questions in the chat box for me? Of course, certainly. Thank you. The first question is regarding my today's uh, my new article regarding Vietnam's land reclamation in the South China Sea. Well, um, actually, my answer to the to the uh, chat box question is that uh, China's I didn't mention China's land uh, the China's reclamation work in the Spratlys in the uh, Spratlys is that because uh, it already stopped the uh, reclamation back in the year 2015, and also uh, Vietnam is the first country to start the reclamation back in um, the maybe 1980s. Um, in the 1980s, and also I I, 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 I write, write this article just to show that um, just to express that the, uh, sometimes the Western media doesn't notice what other claimant states are doing in the South China Sea, and all their focus are on China. So I think that that's uh, that's. That seems pretty unfair to me. And also another question regarding the uh, my last uh, PowerPoint regarding the uh, relationship between UNCLOS, between UNCLOS and uh, direct negotiation and the uh, regional arrangements. And I think that I do agree with the uh, some part of this question that uh, some parts of these three mechanisms are overlapped. But here, in using this right circle, I wanted to emphasize that there are many things that are not overlapped. Like, for example, the UNCLOS does has the Article 1 to 3 saying that the, uh, the coastal states of the semi enclosed sea should cooperate with each other. However, it doesn't uh, give us a detailed mechanism um, helping us to um, follow. That's, thus, we need the DOC, we need the COC, and maybe establish a, a cooperative mechanism in the COC to uh, fill in the gap. So in these areas, that's what I mean, that these uh, three mechanisms can complement with each other, and they are, these areas are not overlap with each other. And also another final, my final comment is to the uh, previous comment to me. I never say that the uh, arbitration award did not help at all with the South China Sea. Like there is one positive uh, example is that, uh, for example, taking the chance of the arbitra arbitration, China does publish several um, government uh, documents, for example, the uh, 2014 uh, government's position on the on the case and also uh, on, on, on China-Philippines uh, uh, dispute. And 
And also we have the 2016, July 12th, we have this uh, statement on China's maritime, South China Sea claim and um, rights uh, claim in the South China Sea. And that makes China's um, South China Sea claim more clearer. I think that's uh, probably the, the, uh, a positive thing. What I'm trying to say is that the uh, disputes, the fundamental dispute remains there so that for a brighter future, we still need to find a final solution to the dispute in the South China Sea. And that's what I'm trying to say. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for those comments, Dr. Yan Yan. And um, now can I ask a final question as we're starting to run out of time. Um, the young leaders uh, who are sitting in conference room three uh, would like to take the floor. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Viet Ha from the DAV and I am a delegate in the Young Leader Program. And I have a question for Dr. Yan and I am very interest, interested in your argument that the COC as well as the codes and uh, treaties should uh, fill the gap of unclosed. So can you clarify more about what are the main gaps of the unclosed which we should uh, fill while making the COC? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I believe it was another question for Dr. Yan Yan. If you would like to respond, thank you. Okay, thank you. Because um, uh, I'm not uh, in, on, on track one, I'm just a scholar, so I didn't participate in the COC negotiation, but I did write uh, quite a few, uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, pap uh, papers or articles on this issue. And I think that uh, for the COC, I um, already mentioned that uh, we can establish like a maritime cooperation uh, mechanism or regime under the, uh, the COC to help to fill in the gap of the Article 1 to 3 of the UNCLOS. And also, the UNCLOS does not have specific uh, rules on military activities at sea, like for example, intelligence gathering and other things. So I'm thinking maybe in the future in the COC negotiation based on the uh, state concern of all negotiating parties, maybe we can have more uh, uh, rules and provisions in the COC of talk, uh, mentioning about the uh, military activities in the region. But it all depends on uh, what we, China and ASEAN member states, what we really want in the region, because we have to uh, make the rules of our by ourselves to guarantee a brighter future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yan Yan. Um, now, I do have one question on um, the slides, which has come in from Lan Nguyen. Um, so we, uh, can I just check with you, Dr. Yan Yan? I think you can see that question. Would you like to respond to that with some further points? If you can see it, and then if, if you would like me to, I can read that out. Uh, it's about the betrayal of UNCLOS bilateral negotiations and regional arrangements as distinct processes. I think perhaps you may have already addressed those points. Yeah, I already yep. addressed that. Okay, yes. thank you very much. So then we, yeah, thank you. Um, so we have one final question then here in the room, if you could just keep it fairly brief. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for the presentation. I actually just want to make a quick uh, comment. I am from the Taipei Economic and Culture Office in Hanoi. And because uh, Ituaba and the arbitration regarding Ituaba or Taiping Island has been mentioned before, I would like to make a quick comment on Taiwan's position. First, um, will be that you, we do Sorry, could I just interrupt um, and note that we only have a minute. So um, if you keep this extremely brief, thank you. Okay, it'll be extremely brief. So I want to stress that we were not, Taiwan was not invited in the proceedings of the arbitration and we do dispute the court's decision. And we argue that Taiping Island is an island that can sustain human uh, habitations. And this being said, Taiwan does believe that disputes in the South China Sea should be settled peacefully according with international law. And we are willing to participate in all related consultation mechanisms. Thank you. Thank you very much for keeping it brief. Um, and on that note, um, if there are no further questions in person in the in the conference. Um, thank you very much once again to all participants. I'd like to um, offer my sincere thanks to our distinguished panelists um, who all offered such different perspectives and um, for their comprehensive and articulate comments on um, the legal order in the South China Sea. From my perspective, um, having had the privilege of attending this conference twice as a moderator, um, I, I'd like to say that it again underscores the importance of dialogue as we grapple with the challenges and developments in the region. Um, and I'm sure that all participants this afternoon, uh, whatever different perspectives we may have on this important question, will agree that discussions are fundamental, that as academics and practitioners look to work together under the principles set out in international law, 
um, to contributing to continuing peace, prosperity and stability of the region, that the fundamental, um, fundamentally important element here is dialogue. Um, and that at the end of the day, I think the one thing that we can all agree on is the um, centrality and the um, fundamental nature of UNCLOS as we address these important issues. So thank you once again, um, and thank you for the opportunity to be here this afternoon. Thanks.